Um, as we kind of get into things, what I want to do is just throw out a question for us. Is, it's this. What would you consider as your greatest liability? Like if you honestly could look inside the deep recesses of your heart, what, what would you say is your greatest liability? What would you say is the greatest risk, the greatest setback, the greatest threat that you have to living the Christian life, uh, the greatest threat to effective ministry? And if you're honest, it probably doesn't take a whole lot to, to pinpoint that. I can pinpoint it fairly quickly. I, I can think of all the anxieties it's produced. I can think of all the stress it's produced, all the tears it's produced. And I don't think I'm alone. And the possibilities are endless, right? I mean, we can go everything from rogue sexual desires, various addictive proclivities, a checkered past that is still marking your present, a very bleak outlook for the future. Could be pressures dealing with finances that just seem crippling as you try to get ahead. It could be a persistent sickness, a health condition of some sort. And you can't help but to think, if I just didn't have this one thing, if I just didn't have to reckon with this, if I just could somehow get healed, if I could just somehow address this, if I could just somehow get over this, I might start getting some ground here. I might, I might start getting some traction. I might start getting some momentum as it pertains to my own personal walk with the Lord and as it pertains to the ministry that he's given me. And if you're a Christian, you have a ministry. It's impossible not to be a Christian and not have a ministry. So whether it's a vocational ministry, whether it's a volunteer ministry, we're all ministers of the gospel. And now the passage that Tommy read and that we're going to dig into Paul's basically challenging that whole prevailing notion. Basically what Paul, Paul is saying is, is, I totally understand where you guys are at. I totally understand what it's like to have a profound weakness, a profound burden that you carry. But Paul's going to tell us that that's actually how God wants it. That in his mysterious sovereign will, God actually finds us more usable when we recognize our weaknesses and our brokenness. We want to come to God with all our strengths. We want to come to God and say, hey, look, I, I have a real good inclination towards technical stuff. I, I'm a really good order. Um, I'm really smart. And then God seems to want to like peel back those layers and say, well, what about that? And that's the thing we've been busy trying to cover up for years. That's the thing we've been trying to like put in that drawer at the very bottom and stuff it in the closet and lock the door and throw the key away. And God seems to have a way of saying, no, I, I, want, I want that. Well, let's hone in on that. I know you're smart. I know you're attractive. I know you're whatever. But I want to focus on that. And for those of you that are geared this way, a simple math formula really for what we're going to talk about is this. Weakness plus Jesus equals strength. And the flip side could be anything minus Jesus is a real weakness. And so, let's go ahead and dig into it. Um, this letter obviously wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And one way that we know that is because Paul had the expectation that his letters would circulate among the churches. And so, it circulated all the way to Florida now, in 2020. And so now we're looking at it collectively as the body of Christ. So let me go ahead and pray, and we're going to dig into this text now. Uh, Father, I, I, I do sense that uh, you love to remind us of our own weakness and our own brokenness and our own frailties so that we can understand and experience more the fact that we are dependent and we creatures. We don't have strength in and of ourselves. But somehow you see it fit to use broken and weak creatures to advance your kingdom and to build it and to bestow your love on. And so we pray that you would now just minister to us, that your spirit would come and teach us as we look at this passage of scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. So four things about weaknesses, and we're going to hone in on verses 7 through 10. Um, but really four things to, to consider is this. Like your weakness and my weakness, it's purposeful. Naturally, it's undesirable. Supernaturally, it's powerful. 
And lastly, it's foundational if we really want to experience true strength. And I, and I believe that the passage is going to really lead us that way. And so I just want to unpack it together. So the first point, weakness is purposeful. In verse 7, Paul says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So whatever he was given, it had a purpose. This thorn that he received was intended to keep him from becoming too proud, too conceited. He got taken to the third heaven, which means a dwelling place of God. And he's key on not even saying that it was me. He kind of refers to himself in the third person. And he's trying to defend himself against these so-called super apostles that are making inroads into the church and contaminating it. And Paul may be saying, hey, maybe I'm not the best order. Maybe I don't look the best. But I got the trump card. Who else can say that they actually went to the dwelling place of God and had a vision of that? And so he says that's why God gave him this thorn. He knew it. He knew it had a purpose. And the thorn, it's a stake. It's a serious difficulty that's been put upon him. And it's a persistent pain. It's a, the imagery of it would be, you know, you're scaling a mountain. You're trying to make headway. You scrape your hand along the ground and you get this massive thorn there. And you're trying to get it out and you realize you can't. But you realize you're only halfway up the mountain. You've got plenty of uh, square miles to walk. And you only got so many hours of daylight. And you know you've got to get to the top. And so he's just got to press on. But this thorn is just making his hand throb. It's making his hand bleed. And all he can think about is this thorn. But he's got so much work ahead of him. And that's kind of the imagery of, of what Paul is saying he's got. And people have speculated throughout the centuries what exactly it was that Paul's talking about. Some have suggested that maybe it was like a physical ailment. Maybe it was anything from malaria to an eye condition that maybe dated back to his uh, conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Some say it could have been epilepsy or a speech impediment. Then you've got another camp of commentators and pastors who suggest that it was a spiritual weakness. Uh, big names like Luther and Calvin, they believe that this was Paul dealing with his own fallen nature. Maybe it was like a severe temptation of some sort that just pounded him over and over again as he was trying to live out the calling that God had for him. Maybe even some troubling demonic activity that was just wreaking havoc in his life and in his ministry that God gave him. And then others say, maybe it was just that. It was a messenger of Satan, a human of some sort that was just wreaking havoc in Paul's life. And Paul had a lot of enemies. He was not liked. And, and for a little bit of context, in the chapter before, you read about this list of things that Paul went through. Shipwrecked. Five times he got 39 whips. They didn't give him 40 because they thought that was too much and it could kill you. So he was very familiar with suffering. He was very familiar with pain. He was very familiar with not being the most popular person. But you know, if you think about it, I think there's God's wisdom in the fact that it's left so generic. I think there's wisdom in the fact that we, we don't know if it was spiritual, if it was physical, if it was relational. But that's a good thing. Because I think each of us can that much readily relate to it. Because I think if we're honest, the human existence is one of weakness. And each of us in this room has a thorn or thorns that we carry or have carried or are going to be carrying at some point. And so Paul wasn't some haphazard victim of chance when he got this thorn. In fact, it was a thorn that was permitted, it was purposed, it was ordained. And if you read a little bit further, you realize who gave it to him. It's Jesus. Jesus was the one, the second person of the Trinity, who gave him this thorn. And that's a significant thing. It's a perplexing thing. It's a mysterious thing, but it's very significant. And as believers of Jesus, we know that the baseline for God is this. He's all sovereign. He's all powerful. And he's all good. But he's mysterious. And our capacity to understand him just falls short, right? It's kind of like me walking into this ledge. At some point, I'm just going to disappear. I can only go so far before 
before it stops, before the track stops, before we're able to see what's next. And that's kind of how it is for us as creatures. And so while the immediate actor is Satan, who intended it for evil, the ultimate actor is good, who purposes it for Paul's good, because even the devil is God's devil. And if you think about it, maybe, you know, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, who are some other people in the Bible like this? You know, the one, one person who comes to mind for me is Job. And if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to Job chapter 1, because I think there we have a similar, a similar dynamic where we are seeing how God is using evil to accomplish his good and perfect purposes in the life of Job. And so in Job chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 6 to 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in your, is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now Job doesn't know about chapter 1. All Job knows, right, is that he loses his children, he loses his house, he loses his health. One comedian jokes, but he kept his wife. God didn't take the wife. And if you know the story of Job, she wasn't the best encourager as time went on. But the point was is that God basically threw out the proposition to Satan and saying, okay, you think Job is just serving me because of all the good things I give him? Fine, go ahead. Go after him. But don't touch him. Touch his health, touch his family, touch his possessions. Touch all the things you think that he has, and that's why he worships me. Take it all away, and let's see what happens. Right? And in the end, Job stayed faithful. Job persevered. Job was restored. But it was hellacious for a very long time. And if you think about it, you know, the Bible's replete with incidents and stories where what seems on the surface as just evil and hopeless and pointless ends up being something that God is orchestrating for his glory and our good. You think about Joseph after being sold into slavery and everything he went through, and now he's the second most powerful man in Egypt, and now his brothers come, and the brothers realize what they did, and they're like lamenting it, and then they're asking for forgiveness of Joseph. And he says in Genesis 50 verse 20, what you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so there's this mysterious element of evil, of suffering, of pain, of thorns, where what on the surface seems like so cruel, so harsh, so difficult, so unbearable, but somehow in the grand chasm of things, God is using it for good. And there's a specific verse for all those who love God and trust in him. He uses all things for good. And so your thorn, my thorn, your burdens, my burdens are not haphazard, random, but they are under the loving, sovereign control of an all-powerful God who apparently knows just what we need and how long we need it for. And he orchestrates like a surgeon to bring about more Christ-likeness in all of us. But it's easy to say, right? I mean, now you go to the point in verse 8 where Paul says, that's great, right? But three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, Paul says, that it should leave me. It's undesirable, it's unwanted, and quite frankly, that's natural. 
Paul was no glutton for punishment. And the prevailing mindset of us is, you know, who, who wants that? Who wants to go under major affliction, major stress, major health complications, major rela- relational breakdowns? Who likes that? And so Paul, he pleads. He urges, he implores, he begs, he exhorts God that he would just lift this thorn from him. Three times. I'm of the opinion it's symbolic. I think it's saying he didn't just ask three times. He was asking over and over and over again. It was a, it was a symbolic way of saying, I am pleading fervently. I am pre- pleading regularly with you, Father, that you would please relieve me of this thorn. And that's an understandable response. Because as Paul sees it, there is no perceived value or benefit. It's a hindrance for him and his effective ministry. And this is arguably the greatest missionary of all time. And he's just saying, God, I I am sold out to you. You literally saved me on the road to Damascus. You have transformed me. I am your slave. I am your servant. But this thorn is killing me, literally and figuratively. And if you think about it, right, even for the world as a whole, what what place does weakness have in it? If you think about every sector of our society, if you think about industry, if you think about athletics, if you think about entertainment, there is no place for the weak. There is no place for the mediocre. There is no place for just okay, right? Nobody goes to the Olympics to see a guy run the mile in eight minutes, right? Right? Nobody goes to the gym to see a guy put up 40 pounds, right? Nobody goes to see uh, Hollywood, somebody who can't recite a single line without looking at their notes. Nobody goes to a beauty pageant without seeing somebody who has a level of beauty that just makes you step back and go like, dang, I don't got that. That's, that's significant. But the flip side of that is, is when you don't have a place for weakness in society, it conveys the idea that you've got to keep it together. And if you don't have it, somehow you've got to get the strength and you've got to get what you need to be considered significant. And I think if you kind of probe deeper in sort of the psyche of our 21st century, there's probably good reason why suicide among 15 to 24-year-olds is now the second leading cause of death. There's probably a reason why social media is being considered responsible for a lot of anxieties and depression that we have in our culture today. Because an image of power and strength and beauty is being projected, and yet the reality of it on this side says they don't coincide. Why is my life not like this? Something's inherently wrong with me. And then you bring that down to a a younger level of personhood, and some people are thinking, man, why even bother living? This sucks. But then you got to go out of the temporal and we got to step into the spiritual. We got to step into the spiritual. And we get it. Nobody likes to be weak. Nobody likes to be considered second class. Nobody likes to be considered an outcast outside the clique. And it's much easier to feel the temporal pain of that thorn. But God is saying there's a divine purpose and ultimate goodness that is coming out from this. And I like it how one pastor said, there's basically two types of people in this world. Those who know they are weak and those who don't. Weak is all we've got. I mean, if you think about it, the whole concept of our salvation is based on the fact that we can't do it. The only reason we are made right with God has nothing to do with what's inherently good in us. But it has to do with what's inherently good in God. And in that God provided a substitute, God provided Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, to live a perfect life, to to be abused and killed, uh, crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day to show that Jesus has power over both sin and death. And that we can come into God's presence, not by anything that we bring, but by trusting in Jesus. By putting our faith in Jesus and saying, We believe in the resurrection. We believe in the finished work of Christ. And that's what inherently allows us to step into the presence of God. 
And so God knows that we are weak, but it seems that sometimes God has to work in such a way where we finally get convinced that we're weak. Because if you're like me, man, I, you know, nobody deceives me more than me, as Paul Tripp likes to say. And it doesn't take much for me to start thinking, man, I got this together. I can make this work. I can muster up enough moxie to make things happen, to, to accomplish things in my power. And then God, being the master surgeon, the master chef, seems to cook up just the right thing to put just the right amount of pressures that expose just enough of your idols where it just brings you to your knees and you realize you're lost and you're hopeless and you're just a fool. And it's a good thing, actually. And that it's actually a good thing to bring you to the point where you realize, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't know how to get through this on my own. And that really leads then, Paul, to what he says in verse 9. Basically saying this, that's it. Weakness is powerful. Weakness is a powerful thing. And here's what Jesus is telling Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in strength. No. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul is pleading and pleading and pleading that God would go ahead and remove this thorn. And Jesus responds with a promise. Paul saw one of two options for how to deal with this thorn. Either God was going to remove the thorn and allow him to continue with an effective and fruitful ministry. Or he was going to have to be relegated to a much less fruitful and a much less effective ministry. Because this thorn was literally causing havoc in his life. But yet God brings a third option. God basically says, how about you keep the thorn and I'm going to make your ministry even more effective. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. He's saying that God's kindness, favor, his helpfulness, his ability, his power, his enabling provision is going to be enough, Paul. It's going to be enough for Paul. And Peter Peter, who denied Jesus three times in one night after being ready to go to the cross with Jesus. And if you remember, they have breakfast. Jesus cooks up fish. Peter puts on his garment, then jumps into the water, swims to the shore. Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Shepherd my sheep. He asks him three times because how many times did Peter deny him? And so every time Peter denied him, Jesus had it, well, do you love me? Well, do you love me? Do you love me? Restored him threefold. But first, Peter says this, and this is a much more mature Peter now, somebody who understands just how deceptive the flesh is and how deceptive the illusion of strength is. And this is what he says in First Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger... Be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. So basically, God can't work with strong people. Because one, there is no such thing as a strong person. There is no such thing as a strong Christian. And two, because we get in the way of what God wants to do when we buy into that illusion. But when we embrace our brokenness, we are now becoming more dependent. We are becoming more submitted. And God's like, and now I can work with you. And he says that it's his power in us. It's His power that He works in us when we get to the point of where we're humbled, where we've come to the realization that we aren't strong, that we don't have it all together, that we don't have it all figured out. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now made available to those of us who humble ourselves under Him. And whether it's those rogue sexual desires, whether it's those relational meltdowns, whether it's those bleak prospects for the future, whether it's that nagging, prolonged, sustaining, unending health condition that you are battling through, all of a sudden now we have access to another power that we didn't have. And God doesn't change our circumstances, but he somehow changes us. Isaiah 
basically echoes this in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those whose hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. (laughs) It's, It's the weak who get the power. It's the powerless who get the power. And it's echoed throughout the Bible. Whether it's Peter, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Paul. I remember when I was still living in Southern California, I had a friend who at one point was dubbed to be the next Howard Stern. And then Christ saves him. He still stays in the music industry. He starts using his platform differently. Um, Things go sideways on him. He ends up getting in really difficult... um, family dynamics, his marriage is on the rocks. And I told him, I said, hey, Mike, you know, how about trying to reach out and go see a pastor, get some counseling? And he's like, man, I just don't have the courage to see a biblical counselor. I just don't think I'm strong enough to do that. And I remember thinking, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you don't see yourself as weak enough to the point where you're willing to be open and vulnerable with somebody who can lead you and guide you through the scriptures as it pertains to your marriage and your career. And again, I think God has a way of bringing us to the point where he allows us to see that our coping mechanisms only take you so far. And at some point, they just fail us. And as painful as that may be, that, 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 that very much seems to be what God wants to do because he doesn't want to leave us to ourselves. Rather, he wants to conform us to the image of Christ. And sometimes we are the ones who just stand in the way of that. And so God has to help us. God has to help us. And I ask myself that question. There's plenty of things I can look upon in my life that I've resisted. There is, um, you know, I, I definitely can understand the whole idea of mental and emotional fragility. Uh, there, there are so many things I can point to and be like, man, I, I, I can do this. I can just, you know, pick myself up. I can just keep going. And God just regularly just says, no, you can't. You know, and so there's almost like God wants to bring you to the place where you have a spiritual limp so that you can just be close to Jesus. Be closer to Jesus, stay close to him, hold on to him, and walk with him in dependence and submission. And basically, I think what God is saying is, you give me your weaknesses and I'll give you my power. Let's make an exchange. Let's make an exchange where both both win here. And then that takes us to verse 10. Where weakness is true strength. And that's what Paul is saying. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice what the promise of God did to Paul. It took him to pleading that God would remove this thorn to now where he's embracing all of life and everything that makes his life hard and he's rejoicing in it. He's rejoicing. His circumstances did not change one iota, but his perspective has now changed as he has experienced the power and the gospel in this profound way. He went from bemoaning a singular thorn to now embracing a whole new way of life and outlook. And it wasn't a one-time event. It was something where it was obviously going to be something that was recurrent and that would regularly come up in Paul's life, and it's regularly going to come up in our life. It just is. We live in a broken and fallen world. You don't have to look far to see that things just don't mesh up. 
Things just don't seem to work how we know intrinsically that they should. And I think that's one reason C.S. Lewis says, when you find yourself constantly gnawing and and kind of realizing that things just don't seem to work like they should, maybe it's because we're meant for another home, another place, and this isn't our true home. And so now he says, for the sake of Christ, Paul says, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. When he's talking about weaknesses, it can be any of those impotencies and liabilities that he's bemoaning. Insults. Anytime he's being slandered or mistreated or abused. Anytime his character is being damaged or he's being injured now, he's saying, this is an opportunity for me to be strong. Every time uh, there's a hardship or a distress or a trouble or some catastrophe in my life, Paul says, every time a circumstance has been forced upon me, every time I experience some reversal of fortune, every time I have felt trapped, I now have a reason to believe I'm strong. When we were living in Europe, um, boy, within a two-hour flight, you can basically touch the whole continent. And we had a chance to go to Rome And we had a chance to go to what would have been the jail cell where Paul spent the remaining days of his life before he was killed by Caesar. And so basically you got to go down this series of steps, about three stories down into the ground, and you could literally touch the stones where Paul allegedly would have been bound, just waiting the orders when it was his turn. And that was a bleak place. I mean, it's probably a whole lot nicer now than it was then, but it wasn't so nice. And to think that there's Paul towards the end of his life, and yet he could say, you know what? I'm strong. I'm strong. Because even, even, even when Nero gives his um, signal and I go and I die now, I'm going to be with Christ. And it was all worth it. And all my thorns and all these burdens and all these calamities, all these hardships, everything that I have suffered and endured, it's going to be lifted now. And I'm going to be in the presence of my Savior. And Ray Ortland Jr., he says this in his sermon on this passage, our greatest breakthrough to spiritual power will come through the worst experience of our lives. So the very thing that we think we're hiding from, we're running from, we're trying to put behind us is very probably the one thing that God is prepared to use mightily in your life to give you power. Power to walk the Christian life. Power for effective ministry. And there are replete examples of people that could testify to this. There's a gal named Henrietta Mears. She was from another time a while back, but she kind of set the standard for Sunday curriculums in churches in America. She was uh, pretty influential and had the ears of people like Billy Graham and Bill Bright. And uh, from a very young age, she suffered with a severe eye condition, extreme myopia, and general eye weakness and irritation. And she would often pray that God would deliver her from this because it was painful and it was very debilitating. But here was a quote that she had when she uh, spoke about her condition. I believe my greatest spiritual asset throughout my entire life has been my failing sight, for it has kept me absolutely dependent upon God. Another guy, we uh, looked at one of his videos just recently. There's an evangelist named Nick Vujicic from Australia. Nick Vujicic was born without hands, without arms or legs. And um, he said the bullying growing up was absolutely atrocious. And at age 10, he decided enough was enough. And he decided his life wasn't worth living yet. And so he tried to take matters into his own hands. Um, He was spared of the consequences of that idea. He survived, eventually came to give his life to Christ. And now he travels the world to share the love of Jesus. Um, He has spoken to people in dozens and dozens of countries about how God's love, how God's purposes will prevail And the very thing he thought was such a liability that it would curtail him from even living a somewhat relatively normal life has been the basis that God has given him to preach and declare the gospel to the world. He's married. He thought he'd never get married. 
God bless him with a beautiful wife, and he's got four children now. Maybe you've heard of Sam Alberry. Sam Alberry is an intellectual, just a bright man, a faithful minister, accomplished writer within Christianity. And ever since he was a small boy, he, he was attracted to those of the same sex. And it's still there. It's still something that marks his life. But yet, rather than it being something that derails his ministry, it actually has given him a basis to share the hope and the power that he has in Christ to resist those fallen nature cravings and honor Christ and give life and hope to thousands and millions of other people. Charles Spurgeon, right? What's a sermon if you don't somehow refer to Charles Spurgeon? Right, that somehow substantiates your sermon if you could do that once or twice. But Charles Spurgeon, he, he was no uh, stranger to depression. And when he would get stricken with depression, it would last for an extended period of time. And it would get so bad that he would leave London and he would make his way down to the south of France, down to Nice, just so he could recuperate, get out of the weather, get out of that dynamic and try to get himself back together again. And he would regularly do that. And he's the prince of preachers. He, he was, you know, thousands upon thousands would come to his churches and hear his sermons. Joni Erickson Tata, at 17 years old, right, jumps into uh, water, not as deep as she thought, became a paraplegic. And here's what she says. He has chosen not to heal me, but to hold me. The more intense the pain, the closer his embrace. The greatest good suffering can do for me is to increase my capacity for God. Real satisfaction comes not in understanding God's motives, but in understanding his character and trusting in his promises and in leaning on him and resting in him as the sovereign who knows what he is doing and does all things well. And it's significant that she can say that having gone through as much pain and challenge and difficulty as she has for the vast majority of her life, well over 50 years. And one more example of somebody that just ministered to me. Her name is Gianna Jessen. And uh, Gianna Jessen actually had a chance to be before the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution back in 2000. And she spoke to them. And uh, I'll, I'll read a part of this. I have a hard time not getting choked up when I read it, but it's powerful. But she says this, my name is Gianna Jessen. I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I count it no small thing to speak the truth. I depend solely on the grace of God to do this. I am 23 years old. I was aborted and I did not die. My biological mother was seven months pregnant when she went to Planned Parenthood in Southern California and they advised her to have a late-term saline abortion. A saline abortion is a solution of salt saline that is injected into the mother's womb. The baby then gulps the solution. It burns the baby inside and out, and then the mother is to deliver a dead baby within 24 hours. This happened to me. I remained in the solution for approximately 18 hours and was delivered alive on April 6, 1977, at 6 a.m. in a California abortion clinic. There were young women in the room who had already been given their injections and were waiting to deliver dead babies. When they saw me, they experienced the horror of murder. A nurse called an ambulance while the abortionist was not yet on duty and had me transferred to the hospital. I weighed a mere two pounds. I was saved by the sheer power of Jesus Christ. And then she goes on to say, Ladies and gentlemen, I should be blind, burned, I should be dead, and yet I live. Due to a lack of oxygen supplied during the abortion, I live with cerebral palsy. When I was diagnosed with all this, all I could do was lie there. They said that all I would ever do is lie there. Through prayer and hard work, my foster mother, I was walking at age three and a half with the help of a walker and leg brace. At that time, I was also adopted into my wonderful family. Today, I am left with only a slight limp. I no longer have need of a walker or leg braces. And here it is. I am so thankful for my cerebral palsy. 
it allows me to really depend on Jesus for everything. I mean, you know what the thorn is in your life. You know what the weakness is. You know what that liability is. And somehow Jesus takes that and uses it to make you strong. The very thing you are hiding from, the very thing you wish didn't mark you, the very thing you're embarrassed of, the very thing that has ridden you with guilt and regret and God says, I can use that, and I can use that to bless others. I can use that for you to be an effective minister of the gospel. And part of that means that there needs to be a little bit of transparency. Because the fact is, if we're all honest, if there was a little caption above all of our heads here this morning about what you're going through, it probably might be very different than what the perception is that we're giving. Right? I appreciate my brother Kyle being like, man, you know, things are hard at times. Things are very challenging at times. He's like, I'm just glad to be here. And amen to that. You have a context in the setting here, and you have a pastor here who understands that. He understands that the gospel is for broken people, and there's only broken people to work with. And so you have an opportunity here to be a part of a life group, to find a place of ministry here where you can come out into the light, and know that you got a bunch of other broken people around you. And nobody can point the finger. But the devil wants to keep you in the dark. The devil wants to keep your temptation, your rogue desires, your past, your bleak prospects for the future, your emotional and mental struggles to yourself and keep you in the corner because you're alone. And Jesus says, but I'm the light of the world. Step out into the light. And what seems to happen when you do that, that darkness, the power of that darkness seems to just diffuse and evaporate because Satan works best in the dark and the lies and the lies and the, and the, negative, and the, the negative thought loops and the negative speak talk that just dominates your mind throughout the course of a week. You step out into light, it just diffuses it. It just breaks it. Because here's the thing, there's nothing you can do to surprise Jesus. It's not like we have anything to hide from Jesus that he doesn't already know. Jesus just wants to say, why don't, we come, why don't we come clean? I'm a physician. You're not healthy. It's a, patch, it's a match made in heaven. No pun intended. But the world wants to convince you that you've got to keep it together, that you've got to project strength, that you've got to project a certain level of accomplishment and even religiosity, even morality that will be appealing and satisfying to those around you, to yourself, and then what ends up happening is we just have a whole lot of weakness with the charade of looking like power. But yet the gospel says, how about we have more power in weakness? Because that's power that God can use and that's power that is actually substantive. Last couple thoughts. Kintsugi. It's a uh, Japanese method for repair, repairing broken ceramics. And if you know anything about it, what they do is they take these broken ceramics that in and of themselves were quite valuable. And what they do is that they put together a lacquer made of things like gold, silver, or platinum. And rather than trying to disguise the ceramic and make it look like it never had a crack, these, um, the lacquer now becomes very prominent and very distinct in the ceramics. And so you'll have these bowls and these platters now that have these streaks of gold, silver, and platinum through it. And by doing that, you actually have something that is more beautiful than the original and more valuable and precious than the original because of the precious metals. And I think that may kind of lend itself to giving us an idea of how God works with us. You know, what we think is broken and unusable and when we surrender it to Jesus, he seems to work that into such a way where we actually become more beautiful, more useful, more valuable than we ever were on our own. But it takes getting to the place of brokenness that we can get to the place of wholeness. And Paul experienced that in a way where finally after everything he went through, he got to the point where he realized, when I'm weak, then I am strong. And that's true for each of us here today. When you realize that you're weak, that's really when you and I become strong.
Let's pray. Father, we, um, we don't want to leave here with this being just some academic acknowledgement to what your word says. I'm prone to it, and I don't think I'm alone. And I pray, Father, that you would make that coin drop, that it would drop from our heads down to our hearts. And that for some of us today and this week, Lord, this might be the first time that we've experienced a sense of hope and purposefulness and encouragement that the very thing we consider such a liability may actually be the very thing you want from us so that you could use us, so that you could mend us and make us more valuable and precious than we could ever think possible. And so we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you who have started a good work in us will see it to completion. We thank you that there is no second class Christian. There's no third class Christian. There's only broken people and a whole Savior who redeems and loves his bride. And I pray that that would be the ringing truth in all of our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.